Good evening. evening. Welcome to the Duda Chair Lecture uh, for 2007. We are privileged to have each and every one of you here tonight. I would like to begin, as is would be my custom, with a brief word of prayer. The Lord be with you. you. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for a blessing from above in this season of Lent for our road to Calvary to be enriched and ennobled by the participants in the community of faith whom we know and have known and remember through the years. And tonight in this uh, Duda lecture, we give you thanks for Catherine and for her uh, wonderful academic work in uncovering for us the pathway of the saints who have gone on before us, the mighty cloud of witnesses. We ask that as they are revealed tonight, church by church and in the city especially, that we might give thanks to God for our ministry, our witness, and for the word and sacraments, the precious means of grace uh, in the city. Uh, Bless this presentation tonight with your presence and with the power of the Holy Spirit in the hearers and in the speaker. In Jesus' name, amen. I felt I should just do that to start things off because that's who I am, and I am absolutely privileged to be here tonight to do the introductions. Uh, The prophet Jeremiah records these words, Seek the welfare of the city to which I have called you, says the Lord. And it is the city to which many of us have been called in in our mission, in our ministry, and in our life. Um, The Lutheran church is often viewed in its heartland rendition as a rural denomination that was started by a bunch of people who were pushing sod out in Minnesota somewhere. Uh, which could be somewhat true. But how did they get to Minnesota? We might want to ask that question. They had to come here first. And they came to New York in droves. And they came uh, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And they came as Lutherans who were sent here in many cases or who arrived on these shores. And those of us that have been serving and serve now in urban congregations in the New York metro area understand the legacy that we have been left. Uh, I am a person who was, is old enough to have heard secondhand the stories of the people who started this, the red buyers and the people who were back in Brooklyn in the day. And I was privileged to hear them from people who were at that time in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who had a tribal recollection of what some of those beautiful churches in New York were like in their heyday, the heyday of the German immigration, and how they were houses of hospitality uh, for those who, had, who needed to find a way on the road, and how they became forces for good in the city uh, for decade upon decade. And then, as uh, many of us who are in urban ministry or are here tonight, and I recognize you in the audience, uh, there was that time of transition when the original immigration ended, and no more Germans were washing up on these shores. And, and the change began to happen. And Catherine Galshut has done a, a tremendous service to the church by identifying and articulating for us in what you are to hear tonight, that, that transition of peoples so that the precious gospel of our Lord Jesus might be heard, and what it meant to the people that were in the middle of it, whether they were the old guard or whether they were the new guard or whether they were the changing guard. Uh, It's not an easy story to articulate because a lot of it is uh, oral rather than written, I'm sure as you found out, and a lot of it is difficult for some people to tell. And yet she has told you that story and will tell it to us tonight. Uh, I think if if we look on the back cover of your uh, bulletin for tonight, you can see the passion that Catherine Galshut has for urban Lutheranism, for Lutheranism through the struggle of change uh, in terms of race and culture, for Lutheranism as it has made its way uh, from being monofocused to multifocused, from being uniformity conscious to being diverse. Uh, Dr. Galshut, who authored the book, The Career of Andrew Schulze, Lutherans and Race in the Civil Rights Era, uh, 
uh, you would want to know from me that Andrew Schultz is the godfather of us all in urban ministry. And that when his name is mentioned, uh, there are many of us who immediately are silent because we understand what he meant and what he did uh, for the Lutheran Church and its movement through time in terms of race. Um, so the fact that she has done that research tells you something about Catherine. It tells you what kind of a person she is, where her heart lies, and where her academic interest moves her passion. So tonight, you are going to hear about communities like Northern Brooklyn and Harlem, places like that where some of us hang out. I see, I see residents of uh, these places here tonight, residents of New York City and people who have given their lives to urban ministry. You are to be commended for coming tonight, but you will be richly rewarded. Uh, I want, therefore, to introduce to you at this time a, a woman of quality academic credential and a woman of deep passion for her subject, and that is Catherine M. Galshoot, the Do the Lecture, 2007. examine the history of Lutherans in New York with particular attention to how Lutherans have interacted with place and with the diversity of peoples in the urban arena. When one thinks of the history of Lutheranism in America, one often thinks of rural immigrant communities found in Pennsylvania or in the Midwest. Historically, Lutherans, as with most other Protestants, have not been prominent in urban areas. Yet there is a rich history of urban Lutheranism even in the most urban of settings, New York City. Early on, I want to make a disclaimer. I am not a native New Yorker. I come from that great oasis of Lutheranism, Minnesota. <laughs> in Minnesota, you can throw a rock and hit a Lutheran. But that would not be so easy in New York. Lutherans are underrepresented in the city uh, of New York especially in relation to the overall religious demography of the United States. Currently, in New York City, Lutherans make up 1.2% of the population, compared to 5.2% nationally. But despite being a smaller percentage of the population, New York Lutherans have played a significant role in the development of American Lutheranism. As John Hanna, a Lutheran pastor in the Bronx once stated, in a city dense with people, but thin with Lutherans, particular Lutheran identity can mean much more than it might in Lake Wobegon. <laughs> Lutherans have also made their mark on the city. For example, the Bronx is named for an early Danish Lutheran settler, Jonas Bronx. In the past, some scholars speculated that religion would decline in the urban setting, but American religion adapted and thrived in cities all across the United States, including New York. As Yale University's John Butler explained, religion defied all expectations about its urban demise and instead recreated Manhattan, the heart of New York City, as a modern sacred city. In terms of its religious identity, New York is more known for its Catholic and Jewish traditions than for its Protestant traditions. And perhaps most of all, the city is known for the great diversity of peoples and cultures which have created the religious polyglot of New York City. Within this sea of religious traditions, Lutherans have had to struggle for territory here. Lutherans have had to make intentional efforts to assert their distinct theological identity amid many others. The history of Lutheranism in the Americas has its origins in New York, an area known as the New Netherlands when it was first settled by the Dutch in the 1620s. This history is well told in Harry Kreter's The Beginnings of Lutheranism in New York. Lutheran settlers were a prominent religious minority, in fact, the second largest religious group in the city after the Dutch reformed. Keep in mind that New Amsterdam was being settled in the early 1600s. At this point in European history, the Thirty Years' War was taking place in Northern and Central Europe, the original home of Lutheranism. As the Thirty Years' War brought great death and destruction to Northern and Central Europe, 
This caused a migration of some Lutherans to the Netherlands, and from there, a further migration to the New World. In 1649, a group of Lutheran settlers in the New Netherlands requested a pastor. In particular, they desired the Lutheran sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion, which were not a part of regular Dutch Reformed worship. This effort to organize the Lutherans in 1649 marks the beginning of the two oldest continuous Lutheran congregations in the Americas. Today, both St. Matthew Lutheran Church on the northern tip of Manhattan and First Lutheran Church in Albany, New York, trace their roots to this effort to organize the Lutherans. Though the request for a Lutheran pastor was made in 1649, it took years before the first Lutheran pastor arrived to minister in the New Netherlands. In addition, when the strict Dutch governor, Peter Stuyvesant, whose father and father-in-law were both Dutch Reformed ministers, became aware of private Lutheran worship in the colony, Lutherans experienced a period of persecution. In the 1650s, Lutherans were fined and jailed for worshiping outside of the official Reformed Church. Stuyvesant was particularly opposed to two groups, Lutherans and Jews. This situation was resolved when the English took over the New Netherlands in 1664 and renamed the territory New York. The English gave recognition to the religious diversity already present in the colony. Lutherans were provided with a charter of religious freedom. By coming under English rule, Lutherans in North America gained the ability to develop a fuller church life. Though, English, <coughs> though the English provided religious toleration, Dutch was still used as the language for worship. New York Lutherans were originally united by a common language, Dutch, and by a common religious confession, the Augsburg Confession. This unity was present despite the fact that there was a considerable amount of ethnic diversity among colonial Lutherans. Germans, Danes, Norwegians, Dutch, Poles, and Swedes were represented among the original Lutherans of New York. The first Lutheran pastor who was able to minister freely with the sacraments arrived in 1669. One of the first baptisms recorded that year was of an African man by the name of Emmanuel. This baptism in 1669 marks the first record of black Lutheranism in the Americas. As Lutherans established themselves in New York, they were able to divide themselves geographically into two different congregations, one in Manhattan and one in Albany. In the 1670s, both congregations secured land to house permanent places of worship. Lutherans in Manhattan were first located on the southern end of the island, near Wall Street, not far from the present site of Trinity Episcopal Church. On this map here, you can see Wall Street with, uh, uh, here's Wall Street right here. And, oh, here's Trinity Lutheran Church way at the top. And again, this is the smaller Lutheran Church right there on Broadway. So you have Trinity, uh, Trinity Episcopal Church here, and the original Lutheran Church was right next to Trinity Episcopal Church. Over the next two centuries, the original Lutheran congregation of New York City changed the location of their church a handful of times, but remained based in the lower part of Manhattan. As the remnants of Dutch culture faded in the 1700s, Lutherans struggled with issues of language and culture. In the 1800s, German emerged as the primary language of Lutherans in New York. This was due to the large number of German immigrants who poured into the city, after the Irish, it was the Germans who came to New York in greatest number. While many German immigrants chose to settle in the Midwest, some remained along the East Coast, which served as the entry point for many immigrants. By the end of the 1800s, Germans were the largest ethnic group in New York. In terms of population, New York City was one of the largest German cities in the world. Only cities like Berlin and Vienna had a greater German population than New York. The most famous German neighborhood in Manhattan was located on the Lower East Side of the island, known as Klein Deutschland, or Little Germany. Klein Deutschland provided cultural common ground for German immigrants who were divided by regional background, religion, and class. Lutherans made up a relatively small number of the residents of Klein Deutschland. Stanley Nadel's examination of the neighborhood stressed that large numbers of Germans in New York were without religious affiliation of any kind. With the spread of secularism in Germany, 
Some scholars have divided German immigrants into club and church Germans. And of those who were church Germans, Catholics far outnumbered Protestants. This fit with the overall pattern of German immigration. Klein Deutschland really took hold in the mid 1800s when large streams of German immigrants were coming from the southern and more Catholic regions of Germany. However, in the late 1800s, large numbers of German immigrants came from the northern and more Protestant regions of Germany. It was during this period that Lutheran churches began to multiply throughout the city. The greatest source on Lutherans in New York in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is George Wenner's The Lutherans of New York, published in 1918. And it's a great resource, particularly for this time period in history. It includes a very detailed appendix, which I heavily relied on uh, for some of my research, uh, with information on all of the congregations in Lutheran congregations in New York at that time. It has the number of members, uh, the value of the church property, uh, the year that it was established. It's, a, it's an incredible index, a great source of information on Lutherans in New York at this time period. As large numbers of German immigrants settled in the United States, American Lutheranism took on a strong ethnic identity. While this was true for many immigrant groups and their religious associations, it seemed to be especially the case among the Lutherans, who were mainly of German and Scandinavian descent. In their survey of the ethnic and racial history of New York, Frederick Binder and David Reamer noted that the number of Germans, their language, and most of all, the scope and variety of their community-based activities made them appear the most ethnic of the ethnics. With this growing tide of German immigration, the original Lutheran congregation of New York, St. Matthew Lutheran Church, became increasingly identified as a German congregation. In 1866, the official name of the church was changed to be the German Evangelical Lutheran Church of, the city, uh, of St. Matthew in the city of New York. The word German was not dropped from the church title until 1910. St. Matthew continued to prosper during this period of heavy German immigration and was at the height of its influence in the late 1800s. St. Matthew had a tradition of having a more conservative doctrine than many other Lutheran churches on the East Coast, and it was in this time period, in 1885, that the congregation joined the German Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Missouri, Ohio, and other states, later known as the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. St. Matthew had long supported a parochial school, in 1881, St. Matthew contributed heavily to the beginning of a collegiate institute, which later became known as Concordia College. St. Matthew also supported a variety of Lutheran institutions in the city, including a Lutheran hospital, orphanage, nursing home, as well as an agency which served newly arrived immigrants in the city. Though parts of New York had a strong German presence, German Americans seemed to move out of the city as quickly as they arrived. Even before World War I and its anti-German fervor, Manhattan lost much of its German flavor. By the late 1800s, Klein Deutschland was already in decline. The mobility of German Americans was propelled by their rising prosperity and by advances in public transportation throughout the city. German Americans were moving up the socioeconomic scale and out to less cramped areas of the city and beyond. Uh, on this map here, which is an ethnic map of New York in the 1920s, uh, you can see that the area, whoops, excuse me, the area of Klein Deutschland here on the Lower East Side uh, has already uh, has switched, it's already changed. Uh, the shade in purple here uh, represents Russians, Polish, and Jewish immigrants. Uh, again, already by the 1920s, uh, the Lower East Side became the, the Jewish and the Italian neighborhood uh, that it's more famously known as today. Uh, again, the shade in blue uh, is the Italians. So again, uh, purple are, are Russian, Polish, and Jewish immigrants, and uh, the blue on this map represents Italian immigrants. Uh, the pink are the Irish, uh, the dark green are African Americans, and the brown are the Germans. And basically, as you can see, uh, some Germans moved uptown. Uh, they moved up to the Upper East Side to a neighborhood uh, known as Yorkville. Uh, some also moved up uh, further north uh, to Harlem. And basically what you see in terms of the uh, movement of Germans uh, in the city is that German Americans tended to go to the north, to the east, or to the west. Uh, in other words, they tended to move uh, north to Yorkville, Harlem, you know, from there to the Bronx and Westchester and beyond, or they tended to move uh, west to New Jersey, or they tended to move east uh, to Brooklyn. Uh, 
And it seems as though the greatest number uh, tended to go east uh, to Brooklyn. And so again, Germans were moving north, east, or west. Now, I was presenting this research at a Lutheran historical conference, and John Dagan was there from Wagner College. And those of you who know where Wagner College is, it's on Staten Island. He got very upset because he wanted to point out that some Lutherans did also go south. Uh, and yes, some did go to Staten Island, but not many. Uh, the majority went north, east, or west. And again, you can, you can still find in the city today interesting sort of remnants of these old German neighborhoods. Uh, again, the Lower East Side today, there, there aren't as many signs that Klein Deutschland was there. Uh, but even in Yorkville today, uh, even though now it's uh, more of a Latino uh, neighborhood, you still have some prominent Lutheran churches there, Emmanuel Lutheran on the Upper East Side. And so again, you can still see some remnants of the fact that this was a, a German neighborhood. As Edward O'Donnell explained it, the lure of a better life uptown, or in Brooklyn, beckoned ceaselessly. It was a force akin to the one that had compelled them or their parents to leave Germany for the United States years earlier. By 1910, two-thirds of the second generation of German Americans lived outside of Manhattan, and the German Lutheran population was a part of these larger migratory trends. George Wenner, who was a pastor of Christ Lutheran Church on East 19th Street on the Lower East Side, commented on these trends in his book, The Lutherans of New York. As Wenner wrote, it was hard for those of us who still held forts on the island of Manhattan to see the congregations we gathered with painstaking effort scattering in every direction, especially to lose the children and grandchildren of our faithful families. But when we saw them in the comfortable homes and open spaces of the suburbs, who could wish them to return to the hopeless atmosphere of the tenements? Then in 1904, the Lutheran population of Klein Deutschland was further decimated by the tragic accident involving the General Schlocum steamboat. On June 15, 1904, St. Mark's Lutheran Church on East 6th Street rented the ship for its annual Sunday school picnic on Long Island. During its voyage, the ship caught fire, killing over 1,000 passengers, the, ma the vast majority of whom were women and children from St. Mark's Lutheran Church. The destruction of the General Schlocum was one of the worst disasters in the history of New York City. In fact, this was the event uh, with the greatest number of casualties on a single day until 9-11. Only 9-11 has surpassed this in terms of the uh, tragic history of New York. Uh, because so many of the victims were from St. Mark's, this was an event that was particularly devastating for the Lutherans of New York. It also contributed to the further and final decline of Klein Deutschland. And you can see where St. Mark's Lutheran Church is today. Today it still remains on the Lower East Side, but it was sold to a Jewish congregation. It's now a synagogue. And St. Mark's uh, relocated, they moved to the Upper East Side. They're also in the uh, old neighborhood of, uh, of York, Yorkville today. Uh, again, as German Americans moved out of Klein Deutschland, Eastern European Jews and Italians moved in, making the Lower East Side their own. Because of these population changes in Lower Manhattan, and declining membership at St. Matthew Lutheran Church, the congregation decided to make a dramatic move to the northern end of the island. In the 250th anniversary history of St. Matthew, the move was explained as a way to, quote, preserve the historic identity of the congregation. In 1906, St. Matthew Lutheran Church moved to the northern end of Manhattan to the neighborhood of Harlem. The Dutch originally established the small village of Harlem in 1658 on the northern end of Manhattan, about 10 miles away from New Amsterdam. When the English took over the New Netherlands in 1664, local settlers chose to retain its Dutch name. For over 200 years after Harlem was established, it remained an isolated country village with residents of Dutch, French, and English descent. In the 1800s, Harlem attracted residents from the, others, uh, the city's other ethnic groups, particularly Germans, Jews, and Italians. And again, on this ethnic map, you can see how you have uh, different peoples. Uh, again, you have the blue uh, in Italian here on the north. Uh, you have the uh, purple again, which represents, uh, again, uh, uh, tends to represent Jewish immigrants. Uh, the dark green is African American, and the brown again, uh, is German. And so again, you can see that you have these different population groups moving uh, to the northern end of the island, uh, to Harlem. Uh, 
Then in the late 1800s and early 1900s, with elevated transit lines and a subway connecting Harlem to the rest of the city, the movement of peoples accelerated. Basically, with its choice location, with its idyllic landscape, people assumed that Harlem would attract wealthy residents. Harlem's elegant brownstones were constructed during this period. But real estate developers overbuilt, and around 1904, 1905, Harlem's housing market went bust. An African-American real estate agent took advantage of this opportunity and offered to find black tenants for some of the empty homes in West Harlem. Over the next two decades, Harlem attracted an increasing number of black Americans. Labor shortages brought about by World War I began the great migration of black Americans from the rural south to the urban north. As more and more blacks moved to New York following World War I, they were increasingly restricted in their housing options. As blacks moved into Harlem, whites moved out, escaping from what they described as a Negro invasion. During this period, Harlem developed as the black ghetto of New York. St. Matthew Lutheran Church moved to Harlem in 1906, just as the neighborhood was beginning to change. The congregation purchased a building on West 145th Street and Convent Avenues, a church that was originally built in 1888 for the Hamilton Grange Reform Church. And again, here you can see a, a picture of the church building uh, that was at one time home to St. Matthew Lutheran Church. Uh, this is in the area of Harlem, again, up by sort of 144, 145th Street, uh, the area of Hamilton Heights. It's a very beautiful part of Harlem, not far from the home of Alexander Hamilton. And it was here that St. Matthew Lutheran Church moved in 1906. Still, as the congregation operated there, they struggled with the neighborhood changes, particularly in the 1920s and the 1930s. In 1927, a pamphlet was put, in, put out hoping to raise funds as St. Matthew's was, quote, forced to leave its present home due to unfavorable changes in the neighborhood. However, it was not until 1943 that the congregation made the definite decision to move. St. Matthew accomplished this in 1945 by merging with Messiah Lutheran Church and relocating to the very northern tip of Manhattan to a neighborhood north of Harlem, a neighborhood known as Inwood. St. Matthew Lutheran Church was part of a larger urban pattern in which white Protestant congregations moved out of emerging black neighborhoods and sold their church properties. Their church buildings were often purchased by newly arrived African Americans who tended to be connected either to the Baptist or Methodist tradition. Still, it was not inevitable that St. Matthew and these other congregations had to move. In terms of the story of St. Matthew, there were some blacks who had moved to Harlem who tried to attend St. Matthew. They were not welcome to the congregation, but instead were referred to Bethany Lutheran, a black Lutheran church begun by black Lutherans who had moved to New York from Virginia. Bethany Lutheran was located in Yonkers, 12 miles further north of Harlem. During the mid 1930s, arrangements were made so that the black pastor of Bethany, the Reverend W. O. Hill, could come to Harlem to hold afternoon services for blacks in the parish house of St. Matthew's. They wouldn't actually let them meet in the church, but they could meet in the neighboring parish house. Rather than integrate with this new mission opportunity, St. Matthew chose to leave the neighborhood and sell its property to the Atlantic District of the Missouri Synod, which used it to open a new black mission. While St. Matthew had a tradition of moving from one location to another over the course of its long history, this move to be, seemed to be a typical example of white flight. The Reverend Clemens Sabrin, who was the first pastor of the new black mission, described it in another way. Reverend Clemens Sabrin had quite a way with words, he had quite a sense of humor, and this is how he described it. St. Matthew had stood there all those years from 1664 to the 1940s, almost a visible symbol of what Jesus meant when he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. But what the gates of hell couldn't do was done by Negroes who moved to the neighborhood. <laughs> Shortly after Pastor Sabrin arrived to the church in 1944, the new black mission took the name Mount Zion Lutheran Church. During his first years at Mount Zion, Sabrin struggled with the church's reputation in the neighborhood. The white congregation of St. Matthew had excluded people from the neighborhood from its services for years. In addition, the church was known for being such a German church, so much so that when Sabrin invited someone from the neighborhood to the service, 
the individual assumed, even though Sabrin was black, that the services were held in German. But despite the obstacles, Mount Zion, under the talented leadership of Sabrin, soon became a self-sufficient congregation and began extensive neighborhood outreach. A couple of years after establishing the congregation, Mount Zion began a well-respected Christian day school and sponsored several other activities for the community. As far as the history of St. Matthew Lutheran Church, in the years after Clemens Sabern arrived, he and the new pastor of St. Matthew, the Reverend Alfred Trinklin, worked to improve relations between St. Matthew and Mount Zion. In addition, St. Matthew gradually became an integrated congregation as its new neighborhood of Inwood became increasingly diverse. Still, both small congregations struggle today, striving to maintain a Lutheran presence in northern Manhattan. While the history of Lutherans in New York began on the island of Manhattan, during the 1800s, the number of Lutheran churches in Brooklyn grew to outnumber those in Manhattan. Even today, Brooklyn has more Lutheran churches than any other New York borough. The Lutheran presence in Brooklyn contributed to Brooklyn's reputation as described by Walt Whitman as a city of homes and churches. Lutherans were among a multitude of religious groups who built institutions and communities throughout Brooklyn's many neighborhoods. As Lutherans settled in Brooklyn, they developed churches and neighborhoods with a strong ethnic character. In the mid-1800s, many German Lutherans began to settle in northern Brooklyn. They began to settle in the neighborhoods of Greenpoint, Williamsburg, and Bushwick. Uh, Greenpoint is the very uh, uh, north, northernmost uh, neighborhood of Brooklyn, underneath it is Williamsburg, and then over here is Bushwick. And so again, these were heavily German neighborhoods. In the late 1800s, many Scandinavian Lutherans began to settle in southwest Brooklyn, in the neighborhoods of Park Slope, Sunset Park, and Bay Ridge, along Brooklyn's waterfront. And here you can see Park Slope, Sunset Park, and Bay Ridge. And again, this was uh, where you found many Scandinavian Lutherans. Views of the sea, again, all of these uh, neighborhoods in the southwest were located along Brooklyn's magnificent waterfront and views of the seas, sea uh, reminded Scandinavian immigrants of home. Many Scandinavian immigrants found work in the city's maritime industries. And so again, this was the Scandinavian part of Brooklyn. Lutheran churches were scattered throughout the borough, but numerous congregations were clustered in heavily northern European immigrant neighborhoods. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were some 70 Lutheran churches in Brooklyn, which included some of the largest Lutheran churches in the city. In addition to churches, Lutherans in Brooklyn supported several other institutions, including an orphanage, homes for the aged, hospitals, and missions for immigrants and seamen. Yet today, there are only about 40 Lutheran churches in Brooklyn, many of which are struggling with declining memberships and declining budgets. During the 20th century, the Lutheran popula population and Lutheran presence in Brooklyn faded as the nu numerical population of the borough boomed. During the 20th century, later generations of German and Scandinavian Americans moved to outlying areas of the city and to the suburbs as the population of Brooklyn further diversified. From the 1880s to the 1910s, some 50 Lutheran congregations were established in Brooklyn. Uh, you could argue that this time period from the 1880s to the 1910s was arguably the time when Lutherans were at their peak in New York City. And as I said, from the 1880s to 1910, some 50 Lutheran congregations were established in Brooklyn. As the Brooklyn Eagle reported in 1891, the Lutheran element in the religious life of Brooklyn occupies a distinguished place in our city, ranking second to no other in enterprise and prosperity. The costly and magnificent edifices of the denomination attest to the truth of this statement. Lutherans constructed several large Gothic churches in northern Brooklyn and also occupied smaller structures throughout the city. I have some pictures here of uh, some of these uh, churches from northern Brooklyn. Uh, these are some of the churches that still today remain as Lutheran churches. And again, I always stress to my class that art and architecture are primary sources. And again, these give you a sort of a visual image again of sort of the Lutheran presence, the Lutheran prominence uh, in Brooklyn. The fact that Lutherans had the type of resources to build these congregations uh, is incredibly uh, impressive. And again, I come from the Midwest, and I have to say that these churches of northern Brooklyn rival anything I've seen in the Midwest. Uh, these are incredible churches. I just have exterior shots for you. Uh, but again, if you uh, go to these churches, go in, inside them as well, there's incredible stained glass windows, uh, incredible wood carvings and woodwork. Uh, these are incredibly be beautiful churches. 
And again, now they're home to relatively small congregations, uh, though again, earlier, uh, they were uh, the home of uh, quite large German congregations for the most part. Uh, but again, you get some sense of, of the Lutheran presence here in northern Brooklyn. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, Lutherans were among the leading Protestant groups in the city. However, New York and Brooklyn still had a greater preponderance of Catholics and Jews. While Lutherans made up a relatively small number uh, of New Yorkers, in the early 20th century, their presence was more than double what it is today. Though Lutherans were a small part of the general population, they were heavily concentrated in some parts of the city. Around the beginning of the 20th century, it was the northern Brooklyn neighborhoods of Williamsburg and Bushwick which were most known for their German character. And again, here you have Williamsburg, and here you have Bushwick. Uh, Williamsburg uh, was famously the setting uh, for the fictionalized German immigrant world uh, of Betty Smith's A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. And that, that story, that novel, is set here in Williamsburg, Bro Brooklyn. Uh, Bushwick was home to numerous breweries and beer gardens. It was known as the beer capital of New York. In these German-American neighborhoods, it was easy for German immigrants to resist assimilation, uh, especially more so here than in other parts of the city with more mixed neighborhoods. Here, German Lutheran communities and congregations took root, which also served as havens for the preservation of German culture. In addition to Sunday worship, German Lutheran churches provided a number of different educational and social opportunities for their members, including parochial schools, congregational newspapers, and a variety of clubs and activities. Because of the ethnic and linguistic basis of Lutheranism in New York, Lutherans had a natural niche in the religious landscape of the city. But despite some cultural advantages, Lutherans faced considerable difficulties, including a shortage of pastors and a new environment of competitive American denominationalism. Given the number of immigrants from Lutheran regions of Europe, Lutheran churches in New York had the potential to gain even more immigrant members than they did. The neighborhoods and churches of Northern Brooklyn underwent tremendous change during the early decades of the 20th century. Much of this change was centered around Williamsburg. In 1903, the Williamsburg Bridge opened, providing an even more direct connection with Manhattan's Lower East Side. Again, here's Williamsburg on the map, and you can see the Williamsburg Bridge, uh, which again provides a direct link uh, over to the Lower East Side of Manhattan. As the Williamsburg Bridge uh, linked Williamsburg and Manhattan, soon tens of thousands of Jewish, Italian, and Slavic immigrants resettled across the East River. Within a few years, Williamsburg had become an extension of the Lower East Side with even more crowded streets, tenements, and schools. Within the span of a few decades, Williamsburg, once a more affluent area, was transformed into the city's most industrialized, most densely populated, and impoverished neighborhood. The Lutheran churches of Northern Brooklyn struggled with these changes. Congregational histories noted and sometimes complained of the changing neighborhood conditions. As one congregational history put it, there was a repetition of the experiences the east side of Manhattan went through when the Hebrews invaded it. The Christian population had to give way before it and was driven to outlying portions of the city. A later history of the same congregation described it this way. The influx of new and strange faces coming in ever-increasing numbers across the Williamsburg Bridge forced more and more old residents to move out of the district. As new groups of people moved to northern Brooklyn, Perceived and real differences in religion, race, and class propelled the movement of Lutherans to other areas. However, other forces were also at work. Second and third generation immigrant families who were often more assimilated to American culture did not necessarily want to stay living in old ethnic neighborhoods when automobiles and other forms of mass transit enabled them to live in more open spaces further afield. In addition, the two world wars against Germany and a period of prohibition brought increased pressure on German Americans to assimilate. So there were both push and pull factors at work in these migratory movements. It was during the decades between World War I and World War II when the Lutheran churches in Brooklyn began to experience these changes. Congregational histories describe difficulties due to the Great Depression of the 1930s and membership losses due to the relocation of families to outlying areas of the city. During this period, Queens, uh, just to the north of Brooklyn, oops, sorry, Queens, just to the north of Brooklyn, uh, was considered uh, um, 
uh, less developed area of the city, uh, and basically it was seen as the new mission field of New York. Some Brooklyn churches began mission congregations in Queens or began to relocate to the borough. According to the mentality of the time, it was mission-minded to follow the general patterns of population change and urban growth. Still, despite the growth of Queens and other areas of the city, Lutherans still maintained a relatively strong presence in Brooklyn. Around the time of World War II, in terms of the sheer number of churches, Lutherans were still the second largest Protestant denomination in Brooklyn. But following World War II, even greater demographic and economic changes came to Brooklyn. With new restrictions on foreign immigration put into place in the 1920s, New York's population began to grow more from internal sources of migration. The middle decades of the 20th century brought a growing number of African Americans from the rural south to the urban north, in addition to a growing number of Puerto Ricans who settled in the city. Many of these newcomers originally lived in Harlem, but then in 1936, the subway, the A train, was extended to Brooklyn, encouraging thousands to leave Harlem for Brooklyn. Many African Americans moved to Bedford-Stuyvesant, which had been the home of a historic African American settlement in the 19th century, and eventually became the largest African American community on the continent. And again, you can see where Bedford-Stuyvesant is uh, right here on the map. Uh, again, this is the largest African American community in North America on the continent. And the interesting thing for me about this is that again, Bedford-Stuyvesant is just south of Williamsburg and Bushwick. And so Bedford-Stuyvesant, the heart of black Brooklyn, is located just to the south of historically German American neighborhoods of Williamsburg and Bushwick. Despite Jackie Robertson's integration of the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947, Federal and local policies created increasing residential segregation in New York and in other cities all across the nation in the middle decades of the 20th century. Brooklyn became divided, with African and Latino Americans being restricted to northern Brooklyn and middle class white people being drawn to southern Brooklyn. At the same time that Brooklyn's minority population was increasing, its industrial economy was declining. Due to limited housing options, African Americans and other minorities were crowded into neighborhoods with deteriorating social and economic conditions. In the midst of these major demographic and economic changes, the strong Lutheran congregations of Northern Brooklyn eroded. Like many other Protestant denominations, Lutherans struggled to remain in the city. Gibson Winter commented on this wider phenomena in his well-known book, The Suburban Captivity of the Churches, published in 1962. As the Lutheran churches of Northern Brooklyn experienced neighborhood change, they responded in different ways. Some churches closed, some moved to another location, sometimes merging with another Lutheran congregation, and some continued to operate with a much smaller membership. Of the 15 Lutheran churches located in the Northern Brooklyn neighborhoods of Greenpoint, Williamsburg, and Bushwick at the beginning of the 20th century, only six continue to exist as Lutheran congregations today. So again, in these three northern uh, Brooklyn neighborhoods, there were 15 Lutheran churches at the beginning of the 20th century, and today uh, only six continue to exist as Lutheran congregations. Of all the Lutheran churches in northern Brooklyn, St. John the Evangelist in Williamsburg stands out for its efforts to adapt to neighborhood change. St. John the Evangelist is the oldest continuous Lutheran congregation in Brooklyn begun in 1844. At one time, St. John served as the anchor of a solid German-American community. At the beginning of the 20th century, the membership and finances of St. John's were at its peak, with the church ministering to around 3,000 souls. In addition, St. John assisted in the establishment of other Lutheran congregations in Brooklyn, St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Bushwick, again, just a little bit further to the west uh, from Williamsburg, and also St. Peter's Lutheran Church uh, in Cypress Hills. And so again, St. Paul's in Bushwick and St. Peter's in Cypress Hills were sort of daughter congregations of St. John the Evangelist. But then in the 1920s, St. John's began to experience neighborhood change. A large number of its membership relocated to other areas, many settled in Queens. With so many members moving to Queens, St. John started a second congregation there in the nearby German-American neighborhood of Glendale. 
And if you uh, can want to sort of know where Glendale is on this map, it's just to the north of the Cypress Hills Cemetery. So again, you can see it's just to the north of this cemetery, not too far away from Williamsburg. So for a time, St. John's had two parishes, one congregation, one church, but again, two different sort of uh, sites and locations. For over two decades, St. John's operated as a single parish with one congregation in Brooklyn and another in Queens. But then these two congregations formally split in 1953. It may have been somewhat natural for these two congregations located in different neighborhoods to separate. However, there were added ethnic, racial, and class differences that were involved in the process. The neighborhood of Glendale retained a German-American character throughout the 20th century, whereas Williamsburg became home to an increasingly diverse population of people, many of whom were racial minorities. In the early 1950s, there was a struggle over the issue of black membership at St. John's, which contributed to the split between the two congregations. The Reverend Richard Clough was a pioneer in racial integration in the church, and during his pastorate, the first black members joined St. John the Evangelist. And uh, again, he was originally sort of the assistant or associate pastor, but when the two congregations split, he became the head pastor and worked to, to integrate St. John the Evangelist. In the decades following World War II, St. John the Evangelist emerged as a model for others, serving as an effective inner city congregation. Members credit two reasons for the effectiveness of the congregation, leadership and neighborhood outreach. Efforts at neighborhood outreach intensified with the pastoral leadership of the 1960s and the 1970s. When the Reverend Richard John Newhouse came to St. John the Evangelist in 1961, it was still struggling as a small congregation, about half black and half white. Uh, today, uh, again, Richard John Newhouse is the young guy in the center. Uh, today he's very famous, he's a prominent uh, Roman Catholic priest, but back in the 60s and 70s he was a Lutheran pastor, and he was a pastor in St. John the Evangelist. When the Missouri Synod's Atlantic District uh, reported on Newhouse's installation, it was considered noteworthy that, quote, this church offered weekly communion to colored and white people at the same altar rail. <laughs> Shocking <laughs> for us, I know. Um, during his first years as pastor, Newhouse worked to reach out to the community, but not only to reach out to the community, but also to communicate to the larger Christian community about the need for urban ministry. Newhouse wrote reports and articles stressing that Christians must, quote, recognize the degree to which we have frequently unconsciously determined our self-image and methods for the purpose of communicating exclusively to our kind of people. The true unity of the church dare not be confused with white middle-class uniformity. Newhouse's writings also stress the importance of the theology of the cross in urban ministry. In Newhouse's years as pastor of St. John the Evangelist from 1961 to 1977, the membership of the church grew and the church became involved with social and political activism. It participated in the civil rights movement both locally and nationally. It supported the Reverend Milton Gamelson, a Presbyterian minister, and his struggle to in integrate New York City's public schools. Another indication of the church's involvement in civil rights was the fact that on certain occasions, the church hosted leading members of the movement, including Ralph Abernathy, Shirley Chisholm, and Coretta Scott King. Later, under Newhouse's leadership, the church also became active in the peace movement against the Vietnam War. In addition, St. John the Evangelist served the larger Lutheran church. It became a training ground for young Lutheran church workers interested in urban ministry. Several students from Concordia College, Bronxville, became active in the congregation. St. John the Evangelist, along with a couple of other Lutheran churches in New York, served as a base for Valparaiso University's Inner City Peace Corps. Another church was, which was prominently involved with New York's, uh, or with Valparaiso University's Inner City Peace Corps was Art Simon's church, Trinity Lutheran Church, on the Lower East Side. Uh, Art Simon uh, was pastor of this congregation uh, during this time period. He's the brother of the late Senator Paul Simon, the longtime senator from Illinois. Art Simon went on to found the humanitarian relief organization Bread for the World, 
And again, his ministry and his influence continues to be active uh, at Trinity Lutheran Church. If you go down and visit Trinity today, this congregation still exists on the Lower East Side, but they have a new church building, and the first floor is all of a, a, a soup kitchen, and the second floor is a smaller a sanctuary and chapel, and the church's motto is in word and deed. And uh, again, they continue to reach out to the neighborhood in various ways. But as young people uh, from Concordia, Valparaiso, and other places became involved with these Lutheran churches in New York, these experiences gave young church workers a sense of inner city life and provided the Lutheran Church with future leaders in urban ministry. In 1967, St. John the Evangelist called the Reverend John Hennemeyer to be associate pastor. Under the guidance of Hennemeyer, St. John the Evangelist, along with the other churches in Northern Brooklyn, began to offer services in Spanish. With the Immigration Act of 1965, foreign immigration to the city was once again renewed, and numerous immigrants came to Northern Brooklyn from the Caribbean and from other parts of Latin America. Later in the 1970s, Hannah Meyer accepted the call to serve a new Atlantic District Mission Congregation in Brooklyn, Risen Christ, in Brownsville. At Risen Christ, Pastor Hannah Meyer played a leading role in the formation of an interdenominational organization known as the East Brooklyn Churches. In the 1980s, the East Brooklyn churches were the driving force behind an acclaimed urban renewal effort known as the Nehemiah Project, named for the Old Testament prophet. The Nehemiah Project built thousands of low-cost homes in East Brooklyn, building a sustainable community in a previously burnt-out area of the city. In the last decades of the 20th century, St. John the Evangelist continued its active ministry in Williamsburg. Later pastors included the Reverend Nathaniel Richmond and the Reverend Willie Lucas. More recently, in 2002, St. John the Evangelist called the Reverend Jonathan Priest to reach out to the multicultural and gentrifying neighborhood of Williamsburg. Current economic and population trends have once again made Williamsburg one of the most dynamic neighborhoods in New York. And these last pictures I have are contemporary shots, very recent shots, of Lutherans in New York City today. Uh, these are some young people who were anxious to pose for me. <laughs> the last time I was out at St. John the Evangelist. And again, uh, uh, this church continues to uh, witness and minister in this neighborhood. Uh, St. John the Evangelist in Williamsburg today, uh, again, is very representative of, uh, of Brooklyn today, a borough filled with new economic opportunities and new immigrants from around the world. And again, here's a picture of the Reverend Jonathan Priest. One of my favorite shots of Lutherans in New York today is this shot. <laughs> this is a picture of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Bushwick. And you can see the pastor here. This is the Reverend Christoph Schultz. He's the current pastor of this congregation as well as another congregation in southern Brooklyn. Uh, this congregation, St. Paul's, was integrated in the 1960s under the pastoral leadership of his father, Paul Schultz. And uh, one interesting thing about this neighborhood was that in the 1980s, this neighborhood became home to Guyanese immigrants who came from the South uh, American country of Guyana. And some of them were Lutheran looking for a church and many of them joined this congregation. And so again, you can see some of the Guyanese uh, immigrants uh, who are now already uh, here for decades and are, are really into the second generation uh, as New Yorkers. Uh, but again, this is one uh, sort of witness of Lutherans in New York today uh, and St. John the Evangelist is also getting uh, new, new uh, members coming from Africa as well, African immigrants coming as well. Again, when we look at this whole history of New York Lutherans and changing neighborhoods, we can see that there are both discouraging and ho hopeful aspects to this history. On the one hand, the vast majority of Lutherans moved out of the city and did not really look back. On the other hand, a very small minority of Lutherans chose to remain or came to the city committed to urban outreach. Through diversifying their congregations, through active social ministry, these Lutheran churches provided a witness not only to society, but also to the larger church body. The Reverend Dr. David Benke, current president of the Missouri Synod's Atlantic District and longtime Lutheran pastor in Brooklyn, believes that the experience of inner city congregations are vitally important to the church's future. Demographic trends are showing an increasing diversification of the suburbs. Benke also points out that the inner suburbs are the new cities with an aging infrastructure and a new immigrant population. 
The current residents of Brooklyn's, Brooklyn and Queens will probably follow the trends of past residents and relocate outward from the city. At the same time, a process of gentrification is taking place, with some middle-class residents moving back to the city. Amid these demographic trends, Lutherans in both the city and the suburbs have new opportunities to break down traditional barriers of race and class and give witness to their Christian faith. The neighborhoods of New York continue to change, so there is more history of New York Lutherans and changing neighborhoods yet to be written. Galshoot for the tremendous work that she's done in compiling a history and a present-day look at Lutherans in New York and certainly the changing neighborhoods that have existed over the last century and some. Um, it has been a, a, a real joy um, and you've done this chair proud and we are so thankful for you in all the work that you've done and um, I would ask you all to join me again in saying thank you to Dr. Gallagher.